Now, the traditional way of measuring distances in space is what's called the distance ladder. Why a ladder? Because it has a whole bunch of rungs. The trouble is, any given method for measuring how far away things are only works over a given range of distances. So, for example, parallax is a very good method, but it only works for things that are very nearby. Type 1a supernovae or is another very good method of measuring distances, but because these supernovae are rare, you haven't got any close enough, so it's only useful for very large distances. So what you do is you use one method for nearby, use that to calibrate the next method, which gets you a bit further, use that to calibrate the next method still, the next step of the ladder, and slowly work your way up to bigger and bigger distances. We have to get out to distances of hundreds of megaparsecs to actually measure anything here, and we have to, a lot of steps in that. Now the first step is probably the simplest of all, it's parallax. Right, so parallax is very useful because it is a method based purely on geometry. And that's useful because you're going to be able to measure a distance which you understand really, really well. And the distance is going to be what we would call absolute. It's going to be something we measure in meters. It's going to be like a real ruler. So it's very useful. And it essentially is just taking the motion of the Earth around the Sun and the fact that it causes an angular motion of distant stars relative to even more distant stars. It's the moral equivalent of putting your finger out in front of your face and changing your eyes back and forth and seeing your, your, your finger move against something in the background. I suppose we call this the first step of the distance. There's really an even a zero step, which is to actually work out how far the Earth's orbit around the Sun is. Right, and that was one of the reasons why Australia was uh, settled by the British Empire is because Captain Cook was down here to look at a transit of Venus where you could use the fact that Venus was going in front of the Sun and use parallax of when you saw it on one side of the Earth and when you saw it on the other side of the Earth and there the size of the Earth becomes the baseline that you're measuring and so that was sort of the founding of modern Australia was based on that rung of the distance ladder. Nowadays we can do it using radars, bounces or satellites and planets and we get this is very accurate so we almost won't worry about that. That's yeah, extremely a few precise. centimeters right now. Um, so the idea is that the star here being th the foreground of the flow stars over there would appear in different place at the two different times. Now you can do it, calculate the angle. It's defined as the angle, actually heart, the angle you get doing moving one astronomical unit. So in fact, as the Earth goes around, it's going two astronomical units around, so something will appear to wobble by twice its parallax. And the definition is that if something is one parsec away, yep. that's if you get one arc second of parallax. That's actually the definition of a parsec. Right, and since an arc second, there's 206,265 arc seconds in a radian, that tells you that a parsec is 206265 times the astronomical union, unit. That's how I remember what uh, a parsec is, because I know we're 150 million kilometers from the sun, but I can never remember how many kilometers in a parsec. Okay, so, whole thing solved. We've got a really good way of measuring stars. Yeah, the only problem, Paul, is that one arc second is a very small unit in the sky. And when I take an image here in Australia, for example, it is very rare that I can actually get a resolution of one arc second due to the atmosphere. So it strikes me that if we're going to make very, measure, uh, very accurate measurements here, we have a problem, which is how on earth do we measure the parallax that accurately? Because one arc second gets us out to one parsec, there are no stars within one parsec. The nearest stars are about 1.3 parsecs away. So any star we're going to want to watch is maybe 10 parsecs away, 20. So we're going to have to do much better than that to get anything at all. So it's a real big challenge. And with a modern telescope, we can probably measure parallaxes to, from the ground, maybe one part in a hundredth of an arc second by uh, being very, very careful. But that's still not going to get us to only a handful of stars. Okay, so this is our first step of the distance ladder, and in principle it's wonderful, it's nice and simple, it's all based on geometry, we understand what's going on. The trouble is that the angles are just so damn small that it's really hard to measure more than a handful of stars, and before you got more than a few parsecs away, it started to get pretty inaccurate. However, um, the most accurate measurements around today, um, the, most stars come from the, the European Space Agency's Parkhouse satellite, and that was good enough to get us out to the nearest cluster of stars, the Hyades cluster. 
So then we get, that's the first step of the distance ladder, gets us out to the Hyades cluster, and now we get the second step, which is main sequence fitting. Okay, so just to remind us what, how stars work, stars burn hydrogen during what we call the main sequence. That's what our sun's doing right now. And the rate that they're able to convert hydrogen to helium depends on their mass, and that also tells you their temperature. So you get this beautiful relationship of temperature versus brightness. And so down here we have a measurement of the color, and temperature depends on color. And this is uh, essentially a measure of flux. So yep. it's telling us how bright they appear to be from the Earth. And so we have these stars of d lower mass and heavier and heavier and heavier stars follow this main sequence. Okay, so, so these are the red ones. Yep. And they are not so bright. So these would be red dwarf stars. Yep. And then you go up to stars like our sun and keep on going up to... Yeah, our sun's about right there. There's a couple wacko little stars here. Those are stars that have left the main sequence and started burning hydrogen in their shells rather we'll than the We'll come back the to core. them later. Yep. But the idea is, okay, we've got a nice trend here. We can fit a line through here, and that's been shown here. And then we can go out somewhere much further away, in particular out to the Large Magellanic Cloud, the galaxy orbiting our own over here. And this is near enough, about 160,000 light years, that we can pick out individual main sequence stars here if we try hard. Right, so there's about uh, 10 billion stars in this galaxy. And by looking as m accurately as we can with the best telescopes, we can go down and we can see that same main sequence. So we can then compare our fit for the main sequence here with our fit for the main sequence in the Hyades. We know how far away the Hyades is because of the first step of the distance ladder, the, the parallax. Yep. Now we know that the flux we observe is going to be luminosity divided by 4 pi d squared. That's the inverse square law. We covered that in great depth in the first course in the series, and we've hit it again <coughs> repeatedly yep. all the way through. Now if you rearrange this, it means if you have two objects, we can have the ratio of the fluxes gives you, or the square root of that gives you the ratio of the distances. So if we can look at the main sequence in the Hyades and the main sequence, which will appear much fainter in the Large Magellanic Cloud, it'll appear much fainter because it's much further away, the ratio of the two gives us the ratio of the distances. Yep, what's so the we can work out how far away the, uh, the um, Magellanic Clouds are. Easy. Yeah, there is one little problem, though, you Paul. You say that. Yeah, which is the Hyades is made up of stars that have a certain amount of metallicity. That is, they have... Metallicity to us is anything heavier than lithium, or including lithium. And there's a lot more metals in the Hyades than in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And we know that changes how bright stars are. We know sort of how well that is theoretically, but we don't have it down perfectly. And also, this main sequence that we've talked about, the stars uh, don't sit exactly in the same place. As they get older, they move yeah. sideways a little bit here. Our own sun is getting steadily more luminous, even though it's sitting on the main sequence. And so the things will steadily move in this direction. Uh, and so do we know the age of the stars in the Magellanic Clouds compared to those in the, uh, in the Hyades that well? Well, it turns out that the Large Magellanic Cloud has stars of a big, broad age, whereas the Hyades are all pretty much one age. And so that's another little correction we're going to have to make. And so, yeah, we can probably make the corrections to a few percent, I guess. Maybe three to five percent would be a good guess. Mm, maybe, maybe not. It's yeah. really, really ha hard to know how accurately you can make it. Uh, and this, of course, is this is one of the best rungs in the extra distance ladder. It just gets worse from here. 